Hi, this is the e-learning for Law of School Tracks, which is part of your business environment lessons. And let's look at what a contract is, and we're going to start up with some definitions. It's an agreement giving rise to obligations. It's a legally binding agreement, and it's an agreement with specific terms between two persons. So this is just for the theory. What you really want to know is, what do you need in law to have a valid contract? So there are four things you need. Offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention. You need all four of these to form a contract. So take note of that. You need all four of these things. The problem is you don't know what they mean. So let's go into them one by one. Offer is when somebody says, I'm willing to enter into a contract with you. So it can be oral or it could be in writing. You could make it privately, you could make it to a group. And the most important thing is it must be communicated to the person who's supposed to accept. The person who's making the offer, we call the offerer. The person who's supposed to accept, we call the offeree. So you notice it can be oral, which means that contracts can be made orally, even without writing. I'm going to say this a couple more times because it's important for you to remember this. So an offer can be made to everybody. So sometimes, uh, for example, the defendant in this case, he put an advertisement in the newspaper. He promised to pay £100. In 1893, that's a lot of money to anyone who catches the flu after using his medicine called the carbolic smoke ball. And the plaintiff, Mrs. Scarlett, she used a smoke ball, but she caught the flu anyway. So she claimed the payment. And the defendant said, no, I'm not really making an offer. Well, ha, the court said he is making an offer. Because it's an offer to everybody. All you need to do is catch the flu and you're counted as accepting it. So it's an offer to the world. Now, normally an advertisement is not considered an offer. It's usually called an invitation to treat. When you see advertisements in the paper saying special offer at Harvey Norman, special offer at Pets Tanky, it is not an offer at law. It is an invitation for you to go to the shop and offer them money. So Khalil and Kabbalist Mobile is a special case. It's a special case because there was something that she could do, which was catch the flu. But normally advertisements are not considered offers. The next thing is that you must communicate the offer to the offeree. So if there's an offer out like this and you didn't see it, you can't accept the reward because you never saw the offer in the first place. So that's your first element, offer. Once the offer is accepted, you have an agreement. So it's important to know what is being offered and what is not an offer. So there are certain things which are considered not offers. That means you're not starting a contract. Invitation to treat is as I said before, advertisements is a start to negotiations. You're asking people to make an offer. So even when you go into a shop and you see Jordan or h &M, special offer, that is not an offer at law. They are inviting you to come into the shop and offer them money. Right? There's advertisements and displays of goods. In one case, in a pharmacy, they were charged with offering restricted drugs by putting up a sign and a display. And the judge said, actually, they're not making an offer. They're only making an invitation. This is a very technical thing. Don't worry. This kind of thing will hardly come up. But what it is most important is to illustrate the fact that when you see things on display in the shop, even if they say special offer, it is not an offer at all. It is an invitation for you, the customer, to offer them money. Sometimes also, there are supplies of information. In the case of Harvey and Facey, Harvey wants to buy a farm. Harvey asks Facey, a lot of things happen in the 1890s. Sir. What is the lowest price? Facey says 900 pounds. Harvey says, I accept. Facey says, I didn't offer. <laughs> what can you possibly accept? And true enough, the judge said, yeah, he's not making an offer. He's only giving you information. You ask what's the lowest price, he says 900 pounds. It doesn't mean I'm offering to sell the 900 pounds. 
So since there's no offer, there can't be an acceptance and therefore no contract. There's also to carry your intent. Nickerson put an advertisement saying, we will be having an option of office furniture. So Harris went, he traveled for a couple of days to the option, but by the time he got there, the furniture was withdrawn from the option. He said, wait a minute, you offered this furniture for sale in your advertisement. And of course the judge said, no, no, it's not an offer. It's a declaration of intent. Wait until you come to the option, then you offer the money. So again, because there's no offer, there cannot be any acceptance, therefore there's no contract. So you can see, in order to be an offer, you really have to say, I offer to do this in exchange for what? I offer to sell you the house in for 900 pounds. Short of that, it will not be considered a proper offer. How can you terminate an offer? What if you want to change your mind? Well, the offer remains valid until you terminate it or kill it. And you can do it in three ways. You can revoke it, take it back. You can reject, the other side could reject the offer or it could just lapse. So, if you are making an offer, you are the offeror, right? Any time before the other guy has accepted it, you can revoke it, you can pull it back. The moment they accept it, you are stuck. They've already accepted it, you're stuck, you can't take it back. But anytime before they accept, you can revoke it. So right now I can say, I offer a thousand dollars to anybody who can come to my office and knock on my door. No, I've changed my mind, I revoke it. See, none of you has accepted it yet because you, I haven't heard the door knocking. Therefore, I can validly revoke my offer. If you had actually knocked on my door before I revoked it, then I'm stuck. I have to pay you. Revocation must be communicated to be effective. So I must actually tell you that I'm revoking, which is why I told you. Okay, so this is a very complex case. So just let it know that it explains that revocation must be accept, must be made and communicated to all the parties, then we know it's bad. Don't worry, don't remember this. Sometimes the offeree, the one who's supposed to accept, instead of accepting, rejects the offer. If you reject the offer, then of course the offer dies. You say no thanks, or even if you make a counter offer, the offer dies. Then you cannot accept again. Hide and wrench, classic case, again in the 1800s. Wrench offers to sell his, son, his farm to hide for a thousand pounds. Then hide rejects and makes a counter offer at 950. At which point wrench says forget it over and then Hyde comes back and says okay I'll pay a thousand pounds but by that time Wrench had decided to sell to somebody else already I don't have to sell to you Hyde comes in and says wait you offered a thousand pounds I accepted a thousand pounds we have a binding contract does he have a binding contract the court said, this offer, once you put in a counter offer of 950, you kill the original offer of 1000. When you kill the offer of 1000, you cannot go back to the offer of 1000. So the offer of 1000 no longer exists for Hyde to accept it. So, can't accept, no contract. The other one is lapse. Sometimes, if the offer of a dies, then lapses. Also, time can pass. If there's no specified period, then it's a reasonable period. So there was a case of Ramsgate and Victoria Hotel versus Montefiore, where first Mr. Montefiore, he offered to buy shares in the hotel in June. Huh? And in November, the hotel said, you've been allotted shares. Between June and November, this was basically because the hotel was in bad shape. By the time Mr. Montefiore had changed his mind, he said, how can you allot me the shares, accept my offer in November? I offered to you in June. Then you accept in November, I don't want any more. But the hotel was desperate. They wanted the money, so they sued. Well, the judge said he can choose to 
reject it because the offer has lapsed. He offered to buy the shares in June, and now it's November, it's over. So that's just the first element of contract. Let's look at the second element, acceptance. So let's say there's a proper valid offer. For example, if we take the last one, Mr. Montefiore, I offer to buy shares in your hotel for X number of dollars. That's a good offer. How can it be accepted? Well, you must accept it unconditionally. You must say, yes, I absolutely accept. Don't make any counter offers. Remember counter offers? You will kill it, right? Remember the hide and ranch farm story? And you can go by any way. You can reply by mail or fax. And if none are stated, then a reasonable means. And you can accept again orally or in writing or even by conduct, by shaking hands. So again, you see oral offer, oral acceptance, we end up with an oral contract. And... A lot of times people think that only written contracts are valid. I'm sorry, even an oral contract is valid. A written contract is easier to prove because it's all written down. But I can tell you if you have enough witnesses to an oral contract, you are stuck. Okay, let's talk about acceptance. You must communicate your acceptance. So after the offerer has been offering, you must tell them, I accept your offer. So you cannot have... We like to say silence is consent. There's no such thing in contract law. There's no such thing as silence is consent in contract law. So there was a case of Felt House in Binley. This is a uncle right, writing to his nephew, offering to buy his house a horse for 30 pounds, which in 1862 is worth a lot. The uncle says, if I don't hear from you, I consider the horse mine. He's trying to say that silence is consent. The nephew was probably fed up, didn't reply. He sold the horse to somebody else. Then this kind of uncle, he sues the nephew and says, look, I didn't hear from you, so I can consider it mine. The court said, no such thing. Silence cannot be acceptance. There's no contract. You can, there's no way that the nephew intended to accept it by not saying anything. He was just ignoring you because you're a nut. Okay. So that's acceptance. Acceptance is a very... Uh, I think that balances together with offer it might be offered and might be acceptance. Now, third element, there must be an intention to create legal relations. What is this intention? Well, you will look at the situation. In a commercial and business agreement, that means people are dealing with business and commerce or buying and selling things. We will usually the court will assume that whatever they discuss is meant to be binding. But you know, the best thing in a social agreement. The court will take a different view. So let's look at it. There's a commercial and business agreement and there's a presumption that there is an intention to create legal relationships. So when you see a buyer, seller, uh, this kind of commercial relationship existing, we will assume that if they have offered an acceptance, there is an intention to do be legally binding. Okay. But if it's between domestic and social, domestic meaning family, social meaning between friends, the court will say that we don't, we won't presume that they intend it to be legally binding because many times friends will you know, say things or family members say things that don't mind mean to be legally binding. In both cases, this is just the first presumption or assumption. You can still prove that it's the opposite, but the first presumption or assumption, if you have a commercial relationship, it will be binding. If you have a domestic relationship, it won't be binding. The last one is you must have consideration. Consideration is a special word in contract. Consideration in contract is not what you think. It is not what you think. It is what value you transfer. So consideration is not what you think. It is what value you transfer. So it is a price of compensation given for the promise. So there must be consideration. Every contract, you are making a promise and receiving a promise from the other person. Each is doing the same. So there must be a real consideration. There must be some value. Either I do something for you or I give you something and then you must pay me or do something for me in return. But 
it not, may not be adequate. You don't have to have a valuation of how much it is. If I'm willing to pay you a million dollars to sweep my floor, okay. If I'm willing, if you're willing to paint my house for 20 cents, also okay, it doesn't have to balance. Then it must be legal consideration, it can't be in the past. So the consideration must be real, it must be of some value, even if it's small value. And love cannot be consideration. Things that you are obligated by duty also cannot be consideration. May not be adequate. So ten dollars for one car, oh, it's valid. One peppercorn or sesame seed for a car, also valid. Used chocolate wrappers can be used as consideration as well. So long as it is real, so long as there is some value, even a used chocolate wrapper has some value. Can you imagine? Even a sesame seed has some value. The consideration must be sufficient. If it's something that you've already promised to do, I'm sorry, you can't use that as your consideration. It's still can my Rick's case, there were sailors who had already been on a contract to work on a ship. Then when two guys abandoned ship, the captain offered extra money to the ones who remained. Then in the end, they didn't pay. So the sailors sued. Unfortunately for the sailors, they said, that's not a binding contract because you're already under obligation to pay, to work. So they don't have to pay. So consideration must finally move from the promise seat. So somebody who is providing the value must be the one who provides the promise. So you see, Susie signs up for training, but it's Susie's employer who pays for the training. So when the company fails to conduct the training, it is not Susie who can sue, but it's the company who provided the money who can sue. Fourth one, contingency must be legal. So you can't get an agreement to do unlawful acts, scratching a car or running a gambling den. And it shouldn't be passed. If it's passed, then it's not a promise anymore. It's history. So if William is delighted with his mid performance in December and he says he'll give her extra $50 in March, it's sorry, it's not binding because it's behind. So here you have the four elements of contract. And in order for a contract to be valid and enforceable, all you need is to have all four elements and then the parties must have the capacity to enter the contract and there must nothing to overcome it. So here we are at the first point, all four elements of the contract are present and we've seen them already. Offer, acceptance, intention to create a legal contract and consideration. So this is end of part one. So continue watching and we'll go to part two.